August 12, 2000, 11.20 a.m. The southern Barents Sea, north of Murmansk, Russia. Even in summer, snow can fall on these waters that border the Kola Peninsula. But they are the only permanently ice-free access that Russia's northern fleet has to the world. And it is at this time of year that Russia conducts war games for the ships of this fleet. Today, the Russian cruiser Peter the Great leads other vessels of the fleet in a game of cat and mouse. Their opponent is not an American, but a Russian submarine, designated K-141. Her name is Kursk. The captain of the Kursk and his crew make preparations for a mock attack. It is an attack that will never happen. At 11.28, an explosion equivalent to 200 pounds of TNT rocks the Kursk. Sixty-five miles away from Kursk, the American submarine Memphis lies eavesdropping on the Russian exercise. Only minutes after the first explosion, a second massive blast over 40 times greater than the first registers on the American sonar. We will never know for certain the cause of the explosions. What is known is that the enormous force of the second blast sends the Kursk and her crew to the bottom of the Barents Sea. It would be the Russian Navy's greatest tragedy. But the events that sank this great ship did not begin in these frigid waters or in the year 2000. Sometimes I'm asked, when did the, the Kursk accident actually happen? And the easy answer is to say it happened on August the 12th, 2000. But actually, the, the real answer, it, ha it happened 10 years earlier. It happened when the, the Soviet Union collapsed. The revolution in 1991 would bring freedoms that Russians had been dreaming of for decades. But it would also reveal that what had been the Soviet Union was on the brink of economic collapse. The Navy and its great submarine force were not immune to huge cutbacks. Life in the Soviet Navy had never been pampered, but sailors in the new Russian Navy now endured hardships never before asked of them. At its peak in the mid-1980s, the Soviet submarine force deployed as many as 180 boats. But by the end of the 90s, fewer than 40 subs remained in service. Northern ports were filled with rusting, abandoned submarines. Now, running those kind of systems, uh, when you don't have much in the way of financial backup and support, is really quite difficult, and it soon becomes potentially dangerous. They are high-tech beasts. But these guys were so, so transcendently patriotic about what they were doing for the motherland. They were willing to defend it, and they were proud of defending it, uh, regardless of what it took. Even amidst the cutbacks, the seventh member of a new class of submarines is launched in May 1994. This newest sub is named for the largest tank battle of World War II. The enormous new boat is christened Kursk. The Kursk was 505 feet long, 60 feet across at the beam, and displaced 18,000 tons submerged. It was impressive, no question about it. You know, we often look at, at the Russian uh, Navy, the Russian Armed Forces, and believe it's a generation behind what the United States uh, fields. But in fact, the Kursk was an exceptional piece of engineering. Kursk is five stories high, and the length of two jumbo jets end to end. Her mess decks are spacious. Amazingly, she even has sauna baths and a swimming pool. To move all this through the water, Kursk is powered by two nuclear reactors that can propel her at almost 30 knots while submerged. In August 2000, the captain of this remarkable vessel is 45-year-old Gennady Lyachin. He is a respected commander who is admired by his crew as fair and capable. As he prepares to launch his practice attack against the Peter the Great on that August day in 2000, Lyachin commands 117 men. Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Koleshnikov is typical of the men of the Kursk. The son of a submariner, Koleshnikov has been aboard Kursk for five years and loves his work. 
he had recently married and brought his new bride, Olga, to visit the ship he was so committed to. Olga and the rest of the world will never know exactly what happened on that day, but it is possible to reconstruct some of the events. As Captain Lyachin slowed to eight knots, he prepared to launch a practice version of the 6576 torpedo that Russian sailors nicknamed Fatty, or the Fat Girl. The Fat Girl torpedo weighs 9,000 pounds and is propelled by kerosene fuel. But to move this enormous weapon at high speeds, the energy supplied to the motor by the kerosene must receive an immense boost by being force-fed huge amounts of oxygen. The oxygen is supplied by a simple but highly concentrated chemical called hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a manufactured chemical. They start with water and then they put an extra oxygen atom on each water molecule. But if the hydrogen peroxide comes in contact with certain catalytic materials, such as copper or brass or other contaminants, then the hydrogen peroxide begins to disassociate rapidly. It produces great heat. The heat in turn generates great pressure by expanding the volume of peroxide by 5,000 times. But the Russians were willing to gamble on using this temperamental but powerful chemical. Both the British and American navies introduced peroxide torpedoes at the end of World War II, but by the 1960s, both navies abandoned peroxide as too dangerous. Peroxide-powered torpedoes required ongoing and highly skilled maintenance. Such maintenance can be demanding in the most well-funded navies. In the Russian Navy of 2000, peroxide torpedoes were accidents waiting to happen. Later review of records indicated the peroxide-fueled weapon that went into the Kursk torpedo tube had not received the maintenance it required. It became clear that those torpedoes had been stored and forgotten. They had been neglected. And this is not a can of tomato soup that can be stored on a shelf for years. Sometime that morning of August 12th, the high-test peroxide probably managed to leak through a gasket or corroded seal. Once the leaking peroxide contacted brass or copper, pressure began to build with irresistible force, until at last the torpedo exploded like a balloon, backward into the torpedo room. The massive fireball raced through the first compartments, killing all in its path, probably including Captain Lyachin. Within seconds, temperatures in the torpedo room soared to 5,000 degrees until at least four torpedo warheads exploded. With the force of five tons of TNT, the blast obliterated the front of the Kursk. Slowly, the great ship headed down by the bow until she settled onto the bottom, 350 feet below the surface. The shockwave had moved back through the sub, battering down bulkheads and instantly killing all it hit. But buried in the belly of Kursk, the heavily reinforced nuclear reactor had stopped the force of the tremendous explosion. After the reactor, four compartments remained unflooded. Huddled inside, 23 men now awaited their fate. Modern Marvel's Kursk will return in a moment. We now return to inviting disaster, Kursk, on Modern Marvels. The explosions aboard the Kursk illustrate the principle that when human lives are at stake, need immediate help from wherever source, international, from experts uh, around the world, from other governments, that is no time to be hiding, to be uh, evasive, to be attempting to salvage a reputation. August 12th, 2000, sometime afternoon. Four of the rear compartments of Kursk have survived the terrible explosions of that morning. In the red glow of emergency lighting, survivors help each other toward the last compartment, where the air will soon become a stale atmosphere, rapidly filling with carbon dioxide. They are alive, but the cramped space in which they now huddle is miserable. It's extremely cold, it's extremely dark, they're very frightened, and they've probably got 
the feeling in the back of their mind that no one knows that it's happened to them. Like all modern subs, Kursk was equipped with two escape hatches. One has survived the blast. It is theoretically possible that the men can put on breathing masks and float to the surface. But if no one picks them up immediately, they will die of hypothermia. There is another problem. Their small compartment is leaking. The pressure of 350 feet of depth is forcing water into the sub. The worst is in the ninth compartment, which is the last in the submarine. It is here that the propulsion shafts go through the hull to the propellers. With no forward movement, the pressure has water shooting in around the shafts. But it isn't drowning that threatens the men. The problem wouldn't have been the water coming into the submarine. It's the fact that uh, the, the water would, uh, would cause uh, the pressure to rise. As water fills the compartment, the remaining air surrounding the men would be compressed into higher and higher pressure. In any escape attempt, nitrogen forced into the crew's blood by the pressure would turn to bubbles as they ascended, twisting joints and making breathing impossible. Faced with frigid water and possibly dying of the bends, the men in compartment 9 make a choice. They decided that since they knew that the Northern Fleet had a submarine rescue capabilities, they would wait for rescue. And, and who's to blame them? Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Koleznikov has taken it upon himself to assume command of the survivors. After the decision is made to stay in the Kursk, he manages to find paper and writes to his wife. Olga, I love you. Please, don't be too upset. It's 1316. All the crew from sections 6, 7, and 8 have moved to section 9. There are 23 of us here. We have made this decision because none of us can escape. The problem with the survivor's decision to stay is that no one on the surface is taking any action to come to their aid. On board his flagship, Peter the Great, the commander of the Northern Fleet, Admiral Vyacheslav Popov, is aware Kursk is overdue to check in. Now he's told two explosions have been picked up by sonar. As an ex-submariner, Popov knows something terrible has happened to Kursk. He also knows that as the fleet commander, he would take a great deal of the blame. In the tradition of the Russian military, his immediate reaction on this day is to do nothing. Many people say that one of the greatest weaknesses of the Russian Northern Fleet, in fact, of the, the Russian armed forces, is the flow of information. Very few people have an incentive to pass bad news up the chain of command. Popov finally notifies the high command, but it is not until 12 hours after the sinking that an emergency is declared. The Northern Fleet has rescue submersibles in nearby ports whose mission it is to rescue stranded submariners by diving down and locking onto the escape hatch of the stricken sub. One of these submersibles, the Prize, is finally loaded aboard a support vessel and put to sea. But Russian rescue vessels have also been the victims of Russian budget cuts. Sunday, August 13th, 5.20 p.m. Nearly 30 hours after the Kursk went to the bottom, the Prize at last dives to attempt a rescue. The submersible relies on very crude thrusters to position her over the Kursk. Even worse, her batteries are hopelessly outdated and will allow only a short time to attempt the rescue. In spite of the limitations, the crew of the Prees come close to locking on to the Kursk. But their attempts fail and they are forced to return to the surface to recharge batteries. It is sadly apparent that the little Russian sub is not equipped to bring the men of Kursk back to the surface. They were well manned by very professional, very proud, in fact, very courageous men, but they couldn't fight the, the inadequate engineering, the inadequate repair work, the uh, inadequate maintenance that had been, had, hadn't been done for, for many, many years. But alternatives to the obsolete prees are available and standing by. Intelligence sectors of the British and American navies know full well that a Russian submarine has been lost. And both navies maintain excellent submarine rescue vessels ready to travel anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. The Russians know this, but they refuse to ask for help. 
For over 40 years, the British and American navies had been Russia's opponents in the game of the Cold War. To rush to ask Western navies for help now is more than the pride of Russian admirals can accept. Some individuals who are still, you know, thinking that, you know, they're still spying on us, they're still practicing with us as their, as their enemy, etc., etc. This is not a good time for us to get all kissy-faced. What's fascinating to me is it is still the Cold War. The Cold War is still very much alive in the Kursk event. It was probably never realistic that the Russian Navy would turn to the Americans for help. But the British Royal Navy does not come with nearly as much political baggage. And the British have two forms of technology that might save the survivors on the Kursk. The first is 1,500 miles away, sitting in a maintenance building in Scotland. This is LR5. She weighs about 21 and a half tons, uh, and she can carry uh, 16 rescuees. She has a crew of three, and she's developed to go to depths of up to 400 meters. The LR-5 submersible is similar to the Russian Prize, but possesses much more advanced technology. Three zero feet going off comms on Pinger Search. Over. Using sophisticated sonar, the LR-5 can be maneuvered to the escape hatch of a stricken sub up to 1,200 feet down. Unlike the Russian vessel, LR-5 can approach the stricken submarine from almost any angle. A flexible skirt settles over the escape hatch. Water inside the skirt is pumped out, sealing the LR-5 to the sub like a suction cup. The sub's hatch is opened, and the stranded crew can be taken aboard the rescue vessel. The offshore oil industry of Britain and Norway has been responsible for developing another technology that could be used to rescue the Kursk survivors. In order to construct and repair oil drilling equipment on the sea floor, the oil industry has perfected the technique of saturation diving. The technique allows divers to work at deep ocean pressure down to a thousand feet, then return to the surface without experiencing the bends. To do this, divers are placed in chambers which increase the pressure on their bodies until it equals that of the ocean floor. The divers are then lowered to the bottom by a diving bell. When they have finished work for the day, they return to rest in the pressurized chamber. When their work is completely finished, the chamber slowly reduces the pressure on their bodies until it again matches the surface atmosphere. If saturation divers can reach the Kursk, perhaps they can establish contact with any survivors. Russia has very few such divers and no equipment to support such a complex mission. But in the days following the accident, the Russians see no reason to ask others to help. As the storm tosses the waters above the sunken Kursk, time is passing. The Russians have failed in their rescue attempts. The odds are increasingly against the 23 trapped survivors. The courage of the men in that compartment, as witnessed by the notes that were recovered that they had written to their families, was absolutely heroic. I don't know how they did it. Inside the dark and cold coffin of the ninth compartment, the surviving men are left with only flashlights. They gasp for breath as oxygen disappears. Dmitry Koleznikov writes again to his wife. None of us can escape to the surface. It seems like there are no chances, no more than 10 or 20 percent. Let's hope that at least someone will read this. Regards to everybody. No need to despair, Kalishnikov. Your heart goes out to those guys. The Soviet Navy's first nuclear submarine was the K-3, the Leninsky Komsomol. It crossed the North Pole in 1962. Modern marvels will return in a moment. We now return to an inviting disaster, Kursk, on Modern Marvels. The Kursk disaster is only one in a long line of cases of misuse and under-respect of explosive materials. There's the explosion at the New London, Texas school district, the main school building in 1937, where just after school, almost 300 adults and children were caught up in the explosion of natural gas. 
And the second case that comes to mind is Texas City, Texas, where the uh, Grand Camp, uh, a Liberty ship full of 2,200 tons of ammonium nitrate, uh, caught fire. The ship exploded, killing almost 500 people. So what we have here are cases where people were lulled into security, although they were dealing with large amounts of explosive materials. And we would see that happen again with Kursk. Monday, August 14th, day three. Vladimir Putin, Russian president for just three months, is on vacation at the Black Sea when Kursk goes to the bottom. He is not told of the accident until almost a day later. He accepts advice to remain on holiday. It is a decision he will regret. In England on this day, Commodore David Russell is the duty officer in charge of submarines for the Royal Navy when he is told of the Kursk. I think the first reaction as a submariner that I had that there was something wrong with another submarine was that um, really it's the same reaction that anyone who goes to sea has with any disaster at sea is that you really want to help if you can. Uh, I think that's particularly acute in the case of submariners. You know what it's going to be like on board and you know that time is of the essence. We don't need any orders in situations like that. We uh, make up our minds and we get on with it. Without orders or authorization, and still unrequested by Russia, Russell begins to set wheels in motion to come to the aid of possible survivors. He loads the LR-5 aboard a huge Antonov cargo jet, which will carry the rescue submersible to Norway. There, it will rendezvous with the mothership, the Normand Pioneer. You go with what you can, and you get it to, to Norway, put it on board the mothership, and send the ship towards um, Russian waters because you can always bring it back. By noon on Monday, the British Embassy in Moscow officially offers help with the rescue. American officials will soon do the same. But in Russia, military leaders are still pretending that all is under control. Rumors are flying everywhere about the loss of the Kursk. Instead of addressing the rumors with directness and honesty, the Russian military resorts to the deceptions of the past. The Kursk is described as having simply a malfunction. Admiral Popov offers the preposterous claim that communications have been established with the crew and that water and oxygen are being supplied. It is poignant to think that as they were dying there in the ninth compartment, their families ashore were being comprehensively lied to by the admirals that those 23 men were serving. As hours turn to days, media pressure at home and internationally begins to build for President Putin to intervene in Kursk operations. It is no longer the dark Soviet days of restricted press. Now reporters want to know why Putin is still on holiday and why the names of those aboard Kursk have yet to be released. He'd only been in power, remember, 100 days at this point. He didn't understand that he had to be seen to be helping that he couldn't just delegate this to submarine rescue professionals up there on the Kola Peninsula, that he had to get personally involved. Finally, the Russian president begins to grasp the potential political consequences of the unraveling story of Kursk. After a call from President Bill Clinton urging him to act, Putin orders his admirals to accept Western aid in the rescue. One of the first things requested are divers to go down to the Kursk to see if they can get any response from inside the vessel. The call for help goes to Stolt, a Norwegian and British underwater construction company for the oil industry. One of the first calls they make is to diver Tony Scott. And then when the phone call came from Stolt offshore, they were a bit cagey. They just said a deep diving job in North of Norway. So I, I knew what it was because, you know, I was expecting something and uh, just sort of jumped at the opportunity. Tony Scott and the other saturation divers will meet the dive ship Seaway Eagle in Tromsø, Norway, where it will be rigged for the mission. In less than 12 hours, the Eagle heads north. She is followed by the Normand Pioneer carrying the LR-5 rescue sub. Commodore David Russell will be overall coordinating officer for the Royal Navy. What he needs now are technical answers. And we need technical information um, because this is a complex operation. Uh, you need to know what the situation is actually uh, on site. But Russian authorities are not quick to provide such information. It is clear that they are stalling. The British rescue team heads toward the Kursk 
knowing little more than what has appeared in the press. As the British ship steam north at full speed, Russia's Deputy Prime Minister, Ilya Klebanov, meets with the families and attempts to dodge responsibility for the accident. Without any evidence, he claims the Kursk was sunk by an American submarine. Nadezhda Tilik has a son aboard Kursk. At last, her fear and frustration with such lies move her to interrupt the Deputy Prime Minister and shout what so many families are feeling. <laughs> In a scene that shocks the world, a female medic steps forward with a hypodermic needle containing sedatives. She injects Nadezhda Tilik through her coat into her thigh. <laughs> Tilik sinks into her chair as the sedative takes effect. Russia is changing, but some of the old ways of dealing with dissent still remain. Saturday, August 19th, 11.30 a.m. The Normand pioneer arrives at the site of the accident. Hopes are high. The Kursk is a huge ship. A sealed compartment would hold a large quantity of air, perhaps enough that men could still be alive. But the English and Norwegian rescue team is greeted with a shock when Russian admirals arrive for a meeting. Russian search and rescue commander, Admiral Gennady Verich, amazingly tells Commodore Russell that the LR-5 will have to stay miles away from the Kursk. The rescue team begins to wonder why they've come. I think the problem was we rapidly began to get the, the feeling that actually Admiral Verich's agenda was one of, they're probably dead already, we just need to bring this to a, a quick close by finding that out. We know as submariners what it would be like to be in that position. You really wouldn't like someone giving up after four or five days merely because that's what the book said. Um, you'd, you'd want them to continue until there was absolutely no chance. The British and Norwegian team, the best hope for rescue, is at last on the scene but it appears they will not be allowed to give the men of Kursk that one last chance for survival. The U.S. Navy's first use of a rescue craft occurred after the sinking of the Squalus in 1939. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to an inviting disaster, Kursk on Modern Marvels. One way to think of it is that so much effort goes into developing these machines and it seems to suck up the money and the time and the expertise, leaving the tail end for uh, working out the kinks, for writing the manuals, for working through the procedures. What if X happens? What are the people on the scene supposed to do? Sunday, August 20th, 10 a.m., the ninth day. After traveling over 1,500 miles, the LR-5 and its crew are now forced to sit helplessly miles from the Kursk. Russian Admiral Gennady Verich won't admit it, but he has never wanted foreigners involved in the Kursk tragedy. He just wants to get the situation resolved, good or bad, but without foreigners. Dead guys um, equals not so great, but dead guys with foreigners equals, uh, you know, sort of a political living hell. But the Russians do finally authorize the divers from Seaway Eagle to go down to Kursk. Tony Scott and the other Norwegian and British divers have been in the compression chamber for hours preparing for the descent. Now they enter the diving bell and head for the bottom. I think everybody was sort of thinking that it wasn't 100% likely that there was going to be any survivors, but there was just that chance. Scott leaves the diving bell and enters the cold, pitch-dark world of the ocean floor. To maintain body heat at this depth, hot water is constantly pumped into his suit. There's a very big, prominent white painted ring around the hatch, and that came into view. You know, I, I had imagined it to be a rounded shape, and you might have to cling on to it and tie yourself off, but you're just flat. It's just like standing on top of a building or something. After a few minutes, dive supervisors above pass the word. It is time to send a signal to anyone who might still be alive inside the Kursk. Scott will tap a prearranged code on the side of the hull. There's no doubt it will be heard inside. And what we were desperately uh, hoping to hear was a return tap. 
Every person on the, the Eagle was awake. The whole ship was holding his breath and hoping for the best. I mean, we, we did want it to be, you know, if you could will something to happen, that's what you wanted to happen. You wanted to hear something. Tony rests his head on the hull and stops breathing to listen for the slightest response. Sadly, there is no answer. But the lack of response to the tapping still doesn't rule out the chance of life inside. Not having gained any response, that didn't necessarily mean there was nobody alive. You know, they could have been unconscious, they could have been in stupor or coma or whatever. The priority for the divers now shifts to finding out if the compartment below is flooded. The only means of getting at the sub-interior is through the remaining escape hatch Scott and his diving partner are hovering over. The hatch leads to an intermediate chamber, which is separated from the ninth compartment by a second lower hatch that opens inward. If the divers open the outer hatch and the inner hatch is already open, survivors below will drown. It is vital the rescuers learn if the interconnecting chamber is flooded. They come up with a plan to do this by opening a small valve on the outer hatch. There's a, what we call an equalization valve. You operate and it tells you whether you've, you're sucking water in or whether uh, there's uh, no suction and therefore inside and outside are equal pressure. If the chamber below is dry, water around the valve will be sucked inward because the ocean pressure is so much greater. If the chamber below is flooded, the pressure is equal and no water will move. The difference is critical. The problem is, it is almost impossible to observe the water's movement. The engineers aboard the Seaway Eagle devise a simple test. So what we did is we had a bottle made up with, I believe it was milk at the time, some substance that was easily seen underwater. And we just squirted it around the valve. To see, you know, you would see that flowing in if it was going in the seawater. There was no detectable flow in or out. That was pretty good evidence that that hatch, below that hatch, was flooded. The outer hatch is opened, showing the chamber is indeed flooded. There is virtually no hope remaining for the survivors, but the lower hatch will have to be opened. A special wrench is manufactured aboard the Eagle and sent down to the divers. The Russians asked us to open the hatch. So uh, we set the hatch dogging me mechanism to the open position, uh, but still the hatch didn't drop open. Although not yet fully open, the lower hatch seal has now been cracked. Bubbles pulse around the seal from the compartment below. They cause some confusion until someone realizes it is simply the surge of the tide pulling small amounts of air out of the ninth compartment. The time has arrived to fully open the inner hatch. An arm of the remote vehicle pushes it open. The remaining gas that had accumulated in the ninth compartment rushes out. Later tests will confirm this gas was unfit for human life. As the bubbles stream upward, then burst and disappear, so too do the remaining hopes for the men of Kursk. It was a remarkable display of commitment by the Norwegian and the British rescuers who went to the scene that August 2000. They didn't give a damn about the politics in the Ministry of Defence. They didn't give a damn about the Russian admirals. They were genuinely motivated by a desire to save human life. The work of the British and Norwegian rescue specialists is finished. They will not participate in any salvage effort. For the first time since it arrived, the Norman pioneer is allowed to float directly over the Kursk. On behalf of the Royal Navy, Commodore Russell leads a memorial service, and flowers are tossed to float above the dead submarine. We didn't feel we could have done anything better than we did. That's about the only comfort there is to take from it. Except perhaps that it may just be that out of these tragic circumstances comes a little bit of uh, hope for the future. All attempts to rescue the men of Kursk have failed, but the impact of this disaster on a grieving Russia 
is not over. Energetic, oxygen-containing chemicals have been implicated in non-submarine accidents also, including the crash of Value Jet Flight 592 in 1996. Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to an inviting disaster, Kursk, on Modern Marvels. We tend to relate most to people uh, like ourselves, who are uh, bystanders, who are accidentally caught up in these events. But so often, it's the workers that really pay the price for what I regard as carelessness at the top. Um, that the management does not have the proper attitude of the healthy fear. August 22, 2000. Two days after all hope is given up for the men of Kursk, Russian President Vladimir Putin at last arrives in Vidyaevo, the home port of the sub, to meet with the families of the dead crew. He pledges that Kursk will be raised and the bodies of their loved ones retrieved. Although Putin's pledge is well received by the grieving families, accomplishing the feat will be an enormous technological challenge. Two Dutch companies are contracted to take on the immense job of retrieving the great sub. Work begins 11 months after the accident. The forward section of Kursk, which had sustained massive damage from the explosions, will be cut off and left behind. A diamond-studded chain acts like an immense hacksaw as it slices through the double hull of high-strength steel. Working in the tremendous tangle of debris and cutting into unknown spaces is very dangerous. My personal thoughts are cutting into any space is hazardous because you get a build-up of hydrogen and oxygen in a concentration that is very explosive. And there have been divers killed by explosions by cutting into things due to the build-up of the gases. Once the bow of Kursk has been cut off, a huge barge, appropriately named Giant, is towed from Holland and positioned over the sub. Giant is equipped with 26 heavy cables, each capable of lifting 900 tons. Divers begin cutting holes into the side of Kursk with powerful jets of abrasive sand. After weeks of work, each of the cables on the barge is attached to the holes. On October 8, 2001, 14 months after the accident, Mammoth jacks on board the giant at last begin to lift the Kursk and the remains of the sailors who rest within her. Even without her bow, Kursk weighs 9,600 tons. Never before has anything this heavy been lifted from the bottom of the sea. It takes 15 hours to raise the hulk into position below the giant. Ocean-going tugs then begin to tow the barge and its grim cargo to a waiting dry dock in Murmansk. As Kursk leaves the scene of its death, divers place a marble tombstone on the floor of the sea. Suspended beneath the barge, Kursk is at last towed into position in the dry dock. On October 23, 2001, Water is drained, and the face of the great submarine once again appears. In the weeks that follow, bodies are removed, and investigators pour over every part of the sub. Just three of the 118 crewmen are left unidentified. Autopsies of the dead sailors reveal the 23 survivors in the ninth compartment at last met their end in a second disaster. The final event that killed those sailors was a fire, an intense fire, caused by their chemical canisters that generated oxygen, meeting an oily film on the water that was rising in that compartment. Each compartment of Kursk was equipped with canisters holding potassium superoxide. The chemical was used to scrub the air of carbon dioxide and replace oxygen. Unfortunately, if potassium superoxide touches water, it reacts violently, releasing great heat. At some time, one of the struggling survivors probably dropped one of these canisters. Its heat and high oxygen content would have turned the oily water into a blowtorch. Those who didn't die in the fire 
suffocated when the last of the oxygen was consumed by the flames. It now appears certain that all were dead well before the British and Norwegians received the call to come to their aid. The investigative board at last confirms leaking peroxide in the fat girl torpedo as the cause of the explosions which killed Kursk. But that answer does not go far enough. The men of Kursk gave their lives because of Russia's ongoing but unrealistic commitment to a level of military technology it could no longer afford. Not only the technology of their torpedoes, but that of their rescue vessels had been allowed to fail by a system that deluded itself into thinking it was still a superpower. The tragedy of Kursk reminds the world that arrogance and pride can be killers when mixed with high technology. I believe that his history is going to view it as the last dramatic event of the Cold War. Those guys died for the Cold War. We've thought of that Cold War as one in which very, there was very little bloodshed. Well, there's 118 guys and a lot of wrecked families who can testify otherwise. Vladimir Putin survived the criticism of his slow response to the Kursk tragedy, but he had tasted the public's anger as had no Russian leader since the Tsar. Now, Putin demands reform. Leaders who had put their careers and self-interest in the way of prompt reporting and rescue are called to account. Rear Admiral Verich, who had refused to allow LR-5 to even enter the water, was fired. Admiral Popov, who had resisted taking action as men died, was relieved of command. Ilya Klebanov, the deputy premier who had steadfastly insisted Kursk had been sunk by an American submarine, was fired. But Nadezhda Tilik, who had screamed in rage at Klebanov, became a hero to all who dream of being able to criticize their government without fear. The story of failure in Russia's once proud submarine fleet unfortunately continues. On August 30th, 2003, the sub K-159 sank as it was being towed to a scrapyard. Nine men died in a tragedy described as needless. This time, President Putin responded immediately to the news of the sinking and launched another investigation. But Russian sailors had once again paid with their lives for the inept decision-making of their commanders. As the months passed, Russians paused to bury and grieve for the men who died aboard Kursk. They had given their lives to Mother Russia, not on a battlefield, but in a submarine made dangerous by outmoded equipment, poor maintenance, and shoddy standards. But the deaths of the men of Kursk marked a very real precedent in Russia's evolving democracy. It revealed a shift in the way Russia's people respond to the deceit and manipulation of their government. We often talk about how the cursed submarine is a metaphor for Russia in decline, but the families are also a metaphor for a new Russia, for a more hopeful Russia, because they understand that they're no longer prepared to be lied to without reacting. They now understand they have a, a voice in a new Russia. Kursk was eventually towed to a scrapyard where she was chopped into pieces and melted down. But the great submarine did leave something of herself behind. The drama of the men who fought for life within her hull continues to provide her countrymen with an undying example of dedication, patriotism, and courage. <laughs>